Well, I want to start out this sermon this morning by predicting the future. It's uh, one of the things they teach you to do at the seminary these days. Sorry, wasn't there back then. Uh, but here's my prediction for the future. <laughs> uh, he's actually teaching the class next semester. Um, this afternoon, sometime this afternoon, some of you here are going to look at your calendars. And you're going to look at the week ahead, and you're going to see that Monday through Thursday, your kids have practice. Friday and Saturday are game days. Wednesday, you have a meeting at the school. And Sunday afternoon, you're booked with the in-laws. You're going to realize that your week is full. And you're going to look at the week after this one and realize, oh, guess what? Next week is just as full as this one. But then, maybe you look three or four weeks out, and you realize you've got a couple nights open. And you start to dream about what you might do with those few free nights. Maybe it's a date night with the spouse. Maybe it's movies and clementines with the kids. Maybe it's taking a nap for once in your life. It all sounds great, and then, and then the emails start coming in, don't they? And it says that, hey, by the way, that one night you had open, your son now has a club activity you gotta take him to. And that other night you had open, guess what? Your daughter now has a can't-miss meeting and you know who's got to be there with her at it? You do. Does this sound like the weeks ahead that some of you are going to have? We're a church, right, with full lives. There are a lot of us here, maybe most of us here, who feel like we are living in the grind. A life that is full and is filling up every single day. And it's not always bad stuff. In fact, a lot of our lives are filled with really good things, things that are worth doing. And other times our lives fill up with what I'm going to call the meeting that could have been an email. Have you ever been to the meeting that could have been an email? Okay. You know what I'm talking about. You know what it's like? It is like going to the buffet and at the beginning, right, you are filling up with the meat and the potatoes and the bread and you're filling up with all the good stuff. And then why is it always at the end is the guy with the nasty vegetable dish? It's like the green beans and carrots, unseasoned, no salt at all, okay? And so you get there with your full plate, and you try to avoid eye contact with the guy, right? But he always says, do you want your vegetables? And because you don't want to look like a slob, you say, yes, give me the nasty vegetables. And you got to find space on your full plate for this disgusting thing that you, didn't even want, that you don't even want. That is what it feels like to go to the meeting that could have been an email, the value we're talking about today is saved people serve people. And because most of us here are good, nice Christian folk, we would agree that, yes, saved people should serve people. This is a great value. Many of our new members say that this is one of their favorite values that we have here at Messiah. But with lives that are full and filling up every day with stuff that matters and stuff that seems like it doesn't matter at all, Serving feels like just one more thing I've got to do, doesn't it? It's just one more thing to put and pile up on my already full plate, and I'm not sure where it goes. This morning, I don't want to talk about serving as a value at this church. I want to talk about what it means to be human. Over the past few years, I've gone back over and over again to Genesis 1 and 2. Because right there at the beginning of the story where we see our creation, we hear from God himself what it was that you and I were made for. It's right there at the beginning that we learn what it means to be human. And so right there, Genesis 1, right? You've probably heard this part of the story before. God makes man and woman in his image, in his likeness. And he makes them to rule over and reign over creation. And so our first thought is, okay, well, if I'm here to rule over creation, that means creation is here to serve me. I'm the ruler. It's here to do what I want. I can take from it what I want. I can do with it what I want. But then we get into Genesis 2, and we zoom in on what it means to rule. And God's word says this. It says, the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. 
Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. God made Adam and Eve to work the garden. But don't miss this. It was God who created the world, wasn't it? And it was God who planted the garden. Which means that this is not our world, right? It's God's world. And it's not our garden that we work in. It's God's garden that we work in. We don't own the garden God does. We don't own the world God does. So in Genesis 2, humanity is put into a world that is not their own to work a garden that is not their own to care for life that is not their own. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like a servant. To be human means that we were made to serve. This is our purpose, to serve. And so for Adam and Eve, fulfilling their purpose meant going plant to plant, seeing what needed to be cared for, what needed to be watered. It meant going animal to animal, seeing what needed to be fed, what needed to be taken care of. And later when they became parents, it meant raising up and caring for a life completely outside of themselves. And pressed into all of us today is this imprint of God's design, this created purpose that we were made to care for life outside of ourselves. Our purpose is to serve. And so serving is not just a value at this church. Serving is the defining shape of human life. Which means that serving is not just another thing to do. Serving is what we were made to do. It's what it means to be human. There is nothing more human than to serve the life that is around you. Which means that the more time we spend obsessing over ourselves and focusing on ourselves, guess what? The less human we are. And the more time we spend taking from the world... Rather than caring for the world, the less human we are. But a life that is spent in love and service and in care for others. A life that is spent in service to other life, that's as human as you can get. That's how God made us. And we see this defining human trait of servanthood, not just in Genesis. We see it in the New Testament. Writing from prison, the Apostle Paul sends a letter to the church in Philippi, a church that is struggling with division and with selfishness. And being in prison, Paul thinks this might be one of the last things he gets to say. He's thinking he's on the verge of death. And so what is his final message to this church that is facing division and selfishness? Here's what he writes. He says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, what he's saying there is, hey, if any of you are Christian participating in the spirit, here's what it means. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul is calling the Philippian church back to God's vision of who they were made to be. He sees the division that is going on. He sees the selfishness going on. He says, 
you're not being what you were made to be. It's time for you to be servants once again. It's time to serve each other and to care for the life that's around you. Just as Adam and Eve were called by God to care for the garden and to care for the lives of their children, Paul now calls these Christians to care for each other and serve each other. You see, we think, we think that it's in pursuing our selfish ambition, doing what we want, that that's how we find our purpose. That that's how we live to be our fullest selves. But Paul says, absolutely not. No way. Couldn't be further from the truth. It's not in the selfish way. It's in the selfless way that you find your purpose. And you discover what it means to be who God made you to be. Paul is calling the Philippians to be the people God created them to be. And he's telling us here today through Paul to be the people God made us to be. He's calling us to serve. Now, before we move on from Paul's words here, I actually want to sit with them for a second and ask you, do his words stir up a little uneasiness in you? Or do you disagree with him a little bit? Let's look at one of those things he said. He said, uh, count others more significant than yourselves. How are you doing with that? He says, look to the interests of others. Have you done that this week? He says, do nothing from selfish ambition. If those words make you feel uneasy, it's only because it made those Philippian Christians feel uneasy too. I mean, do nothing from selfish ambition. That's wild, isn't it? I look at that and I'm like, I don't know if I could live that way. This is what it means to be human. I don't know if I could live up to the standard that God has set for my life. And so when we read words like this, I think we go one of two ways. We might go the way of despair. The way of despair says, I can't do this, God. I cannot be the person you made me to be. And if we don't go to despair, we go to denial. We overlook Paul's words and say, he didn't really mean what he said there, right? Paul doesn't really mean do nothing from selfish ambition. How are you going to keep the economy going, Paul? Okay. Look, I know what Paul's saying better than he does, right? So, Paul, I know your words are nice, but you meant something different than what you said. Despair or denial. There's just one problem. You can read the rest. Paul say, hey, by the way, just kidding about the whole selfless living thing. I actually want you to live completely selfishly. I was kidding about that part. Never says it. Which means he means what he's saying here. So does that mean that we are just left in the place of despair, the place that says, I cannot be the person God made me to be. I'm simply too selfish. I'm simply too broken to be who I'm supposed to be. But Paul's not done speaking. I want to read you what he says next. He says, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, And bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Paul follows up this message about being a servant. By pointing us to Jesus. By pointing us to Jesus. Who became a servant. He became a servant. By becoming human. 
in a passage that might make us feel despair, Paul points us to our Lord, the Lord who ruled over the whole world, who came down to serve the world by being human. We look at God's word that says that we were made to serve and we know, man, we have not lived up to the life God has called us to live. We have not lived up to our purpose. And Paul says, this is why Jesus came. He came to be who we were meant to be. He came to do what we couldn't do ourselves. Jesus, Jesus is who we look at when we feel despair. He's who we look at when we feel like we don't measure up. And we say, you know what? I might not have measured up, but he has. And he's my Lord. And I trust in the one who's done for me what I couldn't do myself. Jesus said it himself in Matthew 20. He said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve. And he served by giving his life for us. And in giving his life, we are now united in his life. Our life is his life. His life is our life. We are connected and united with him. His beauty and goodness are now our beauty and goodness. We get to put on his perfection and wear it like it's our own. There's been this beautiful exchange by the servant of Jesus who came down and traded places with us. And one of my favorite descriptions of this beautiful exchange. It's a really old quote from an old Egyptian bishop by the name of Athanasius. He said, he became what we are. So that we might become what he is. He became what we are. So that we might become what he is. That's beautiful. You see so often we think. That the Christian story is all about. Having a different destination. We were bound for death and for hell. But because of Jesus we are now bound. For life and for heaven. Amen. 100% true. But Jesus didn't just change our destination, he changed our definition. Through Jesus, we have been given a new name, and it's his name. Through Jesus, we've been given a new title, and it's his title. The Son of Man came to make you and me sons and daughters of God. He came to become what we are so that we might become what he is. Jesus, who was the perfect image of God, came down to restore the image of God in us. He became what we are so that we could become what he is. Jesus changes who we are from the bottom up. We are new people because of Jesus. Remade the way we were there at the beginning. And Paul says it in verse 5. That Jesus' work changes us to become like him. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Through faith, we have been given the mind of Christ. Through faith, we've been given the spirit of Christ. And Paul tells us who we are now, the kind of people that we are now that we've been made new. He says this, he says, do you not know that your bodies, you, are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? That's who we are now. What would our lives look like if we actually believed that we were temples of the Holy Spirit, that in the person in the mirror was the house of God here on earth? What would our life look like if we started walking every day with these new minds and these new bodies that Jesus has given us? What would that look like? 
It would look like life in the garden. Because if sin took us out of the garden, when Jesus defeated sin, he brought us back. And back in the garden, there's life. Outside the garden is death. Inside the garden is life. We were made to care for the garden and we were remade to care for the garden. We were made to serve and we were remade to serve. Now I could spend the rest of the day telling you stories of people in this church who serve, who are being the people God has made them to be. But uh, you don't have that kind of time, do you? So I'm gonna tell you one story. I wanna tell you what our teenagers here at our church are doing to serve. Four years ago, I was invited uh, by Bethlehem Lutheran Church down in North St. Louis to come and observe uh, their EAC after school program. And Bethlehem runs all these different sites throughout North City and North County uh, where they run these after school programs. And it's a place where they pick up neighborhood kids with families that they know. They pick them up, bring them to a site where they feed them. They play games with them and they give them a Bible lesson. Pretty simple and straightforward. So I went and when I went to this site, I, I knew the stories that were told about this part of our community. I knew the neighborhood that I was going into. But what I didn't know were the people of that neighborhood. And when I got to the site, I started hearing the stories of the people and the kids in that neighborhood. And the site leader there started pointing out to me all the kids there and telling me their stories. He said, that kid right there, that's Micah. And his parents were murdered last year and he buried them. Middle schooler. He said, that kid right there, it's winter and they don't have electricity, which means they don't have heat. And that kid right there, he keeps getting bumped around the foster care system and he doesn't know where he's going to end up next. And when you stand in a room with kids like that, all you see are kids who need the church. Kids who need Jesus Christ in the flesh, temples of the Holy Spirit, to come to them and show them that there is one who brings life out of death. And so four years ago, we sent our first group of teenagers. And four years later, we're still going back. And after four years of going to the city, I would tell you, that the only way you will ever see a place like North St. Louis right is through the eyes of the new self. Because the old self looks at a place like that and they say, uh, don't go there. What could benefit you from going there? Stay here. Stay where it's comfortable. Focus on yourself. That's what the old self says. But our teenagers, our 16 and 17 year olds, who've been made new by Jesus, they see this neighborhood through new eyes. Because while the old self sees crumbling streets, the new self sees a garden. Because in a garden there is life. And you can't tell me that's not life standing next to us there in that picture. As pixelated as it might be. That is life. Standing there with us in that photo. Life that goes by the name of Peyton and Paige and Jesse and Micah. When I see that photo, I see a garden with life and we were made to tend the garden, weren't we? We were made to care for the life in the garden. I want to show you a video of what life in the garden looks like. And we're the best of friends. We are. <laughs> hey, friend, we're even 
Did you see the garden? Did you see the life? That's why we go. Because in a world that says there's only death, they need to know there's life. What's so beautiful is that that's what your teenagers here at Messiah are doing for the kids of our city. The same teenagers with the full sports schedules and the club schedules, they are carving out time to be the people they were made to be. That's beautiful, isn't it? A few visits back, Jessie, who was the woman in that video hugging my wife, she prayed over us before we left. And she said, God, send them back. And send them back even more. Now, I know I haven't been in ministry all that long, but I know that when you show up to someone's neighborhood in the name of Jesus and they pray for you to come back, you come back. You come back. Serving is not just another thing to do. It's what we were made to do. And to those of you here, who serve in so many other ways. Those of you who serve our next generation with Hannah and I, you are not just doing some other thing you gotta do. You are doing what you were made to do. Our host team that is here to welcome people into the house of God. Our tech team that brings the message of Jesus out to the world. Our worship team that connects us to the Holy Spirit. You are doing what God made you to do. And a night to shine, man. In a few months, guess what? We're hosting a night to shine in a few months. And when we host it, we are going to be doing exactly what God made us to do. I keep thinking about Jesse's prayer. That we would come back and that we would come back more. And Messiah we now have a way to make Jesse's prayer a reality. Because after four years of going to this site, Messiah is now an official partner church with Bethlehem Lutheran Church. Which means that this Christmas, this December, when you give your Christmas mission offering, it's gonna go to the life that you saw in that garden. It's gonna go to the life down there in our city, in our neighborhood. And Bethlehem is saying, we don't just need your money, though. We need temples of God to show up in the flesh. Because you see, what Bethlehem is doing is they're looking at this neighborhood and seeing a garden. And they're becoming this mothership to all these different churches down there in the city and in the county. And helping them to grow and become gospel lights in their community. And they said, would you help us with that? Would you, Messiah out there in St. Charles, come to the gardens like the one you saw in that video? They're giving us the chance, folks, to be the people we were made to be. More information on that is going to come later. But if what you saw in that video you want to be a part of, um, you can... Put my email up there, please. If what you saw up there, you want to be a part of. Our high schoolers are done going for the rest of the semester. We aren't going for a while. I would love to take a group of adults, of 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds, and show them the full body of Christ down there in the city. And so if you're interested in being a part of that, 
just shoot me an email. And let's make Jesse's prayer a reality. It's Reformation Day here in our church, and I want to share with you, um, I think, what is my favorite Martin Luther quote. Here's what he said about what it means to be a Christian. He said, a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a servant of all, subject to everyone. You see, Martin Luther knew we got to get the gospel right. Because for too long we spent time serving no one but ourselves. We serve the world, but really it's to serve ourselves, to earn our way to heaven. But Luther said, no, 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 it is Jesus, the one who became the perfect servant. It's him, it's faith in him that brings you to heaven. You serve not for yourself, you serve for others. You serve because you're human. And so the freedom that we have in Jesus isn't freedom from service, it's freedom for service. Jesus made us new so that we could once again be the people we were made to be. He became what we are so that we might become what he is. Amen.